2024 was an incredible year for the stock market. And getting ready for 2025 means knowing where to invest, why we had such a fast growth, but also what's going to happen next year with interest rates, strategies of the new Trump administration, how to optimize the right investment accounts we use, and how to readapt our asset allocation to where the market is going. And with this video, we're going to cover all of this. First, I want to give you a quick recap of my investing plan for 2024. The year has been great for me and probably for most investors. The stock market went up over 30%, big names like Meta and Nvidia went up by 70, up to 200%. And if I look back at what my strategy has been, I actually didn't have to do much except following two lines of action. Dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500 and the tech sector and reducing my stock positions while increasing my ETF positions. My portfolio grew over 30% in one year, which is a great result, which I'm not likely going to see every year in the future. And one important step I took this year was getting rid of all the individual stocks that I had only because they're famous, but for which I didn't really know if there was enough potential for the future. So throughout the year, I got rid of some EV companies like BYD, Xpeng, and many important companies companies like PepsiCo, Bank of America, Tencent Holdings, and many others. All companies that are fundamentally good companies, but that I don't need to have in the form of single stocks because it's just more work for me. I made a video about my portfolio last summer, so in case you missed it, you can watch it after this video, and I will link it here and in the description below. Besides reducing the stock positions, I also kept a lot of money in cash waiting for a correction to happen and it wasn't a good idea. In fact, I ended up holding a lot of cash for a lot of time and never using it, while the market actually kept growing. I was kind of disappointed, but also curious to know if it can be worth it at all to save more cash, and I ended up making some research and backtesting 50 years of stock market to see what happens if you wait for corrections. The results were really interesting, and I published them in this video that I suggest you watch after this. And of course, like the video before, I'm gonna link it here, and in the description below. So let's discuss now what we should keep an eye on in 2025, starting from the interest rates. In September 2024, the Fed went big with its first interest rate cut in four years, cutting 50 basis points to 4.75%. This was the first sign of easing inflation and told us that we were entering a new monetary easing cycle that could last even beyond 2025. Then, in November, the Fed cut rates again by 25 basis points. Looking to 2025, the Fed is expected to do four more cuts by 25 basis points next year. They will bring the rate down to 3.5% within the end of 2025. Although we can't know exactly where the rates are going to land, the Federal Open Market Committee itself estimates that short-term rates by the end of 2025 will be a little more than 3%. What we can assume for sure is that rates will tend to decline in 2025. Lower interest rates will mean more consumer spending and business investments, borrowing will be cheaper and demand will be stimulated. This is going to make equities more attractive compared to what they've been in 2023 and 2024. So let's hear what Warren Buffett had to say about the relationship between interest rates and return from companies. 2.4 to 2.9 is nothing if you're comparing it with businesses that earn 12% on equity and reinvest. And the S&P, you can just look at the figures for decades, has earned on tangible equity, it's earned a lot more than that, and it translates into more higher prices than it should. So by thinking about the interest rates decreasing next year, we tend to think that the stock market will grow with almost absolute certainty. What I want you to consider though, is that the stock market is not the economy. The stock market is a leading economic indicator, and indicators can be lagging, coincident, or leading. A lagging indicator tells you what already happened. A coincident indicator tells you what's happening now, and a leading indicator tells you what's going to happen in the future. So the stock market, being leading, behaves first. It anticipates what's coming next in the economy or what people expect to happen in the future. So if the stock market grew so much in 2024, it's because people in 2024 have been expecting rate cuts in 2025 and 2026. Now, let's say that cuts do happen in 2025. We can still find ourselves in a situation where a difficult job environment or an inflation rising again would force the Fed to announce that in 2026, they're going to have to pause rate cuts. In this case, the stock market would perform badly in 2025, even though the rates are cut. Because even in 2025, the stock market will represent the future beyond 2025. This is, by the way, an important concept that most investors ignore, so 
keep it in mind. Nevertheless, we're not in an environment now where interest rates are going to be 10 or 11% anytime soon. And no matter if we have 3 or 4%, if companies earn on average 10, 12% on equity, they're still going to be more attractive than bonds. So when it comes to development of interest rates, my suggestion is to keep dollar cost averaging into the equity market by buying a broad-based ETFs and kind of ignore bonds if you're not relatively close to retirement age. But let's move now to the presidential elections. As you know, Donald Trump was elected in November and will start a new administration in January next year. For you, as an investor in 2025, what you should focus on is the policy direction that Trump is going to take. That's why we're going to talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. When passed in 2017, it was the most discussed domestic policy of the Trump administration, and it basically saw a tax reduction for corporations. Now that Trump won, we can expect the provision to be extended, along with other tax breaks that Trump spoke about. Lower tax collections are going to make it harder for the government to control the budget deficit, namely the government, with less cash coming in from taxes, is going to have a harder time covering the government expenses. That's why Trump took Elon Musk on board in creating the Dodge. Department of Government Efficiency, with a task to reduce government spending. So we're going to have lower taxes that are going to help large corporations and partially also small businesses. And hopefully, if Elon Musk does his job, we're not going to have a huge increase in the deficit. We can't know how it's going to end, but we can assume that the combination of lower taxes and higher efficiency are probably going to help increase American growth. The second important point of the administration is tariffs on imported goods. Tariffs, by the way, were imposed by Trump but were also kept on by the Biden administration. Generally speaking, they're going to encourage the building of factories in the US, so they will generate revenue for the US government, but of course, this has to happen gradually to avoid too much increase in the costs for consumers. So we can say it's a positive thing, but it does have repercussions in the relations with China and other world powers. I expect whatever decision will be taken regarding tariffs next year to create a lot of volatility in the stock market. So I'm personally going to be ready to invest a little heavier if such fluctuations shall occur, while for the rest of the time, I'm still going to dollar cost average into the S&P 500. Another thing that you absolutely need to do is take advantage of the tax benefits of retirement accounts, in particular 401ks and IRAs. The total contribution for 401ks has been increased for 2025 from $23,000 to $23,500, with an extra $7,500 for workers age 50 and older, which is called a catch-up contribution. But starting in 2005, workers age 60 to 63 can boost annual catch-up contributions to $11,250 or 150% of the catch-up limit, whichever of the two is greater. For IRAs, the contribution limit is still $7,000 like in 2024, or $8,000 if you're age 50 or older. Now, you need to use these accounts as much as possible because the tax advantage is incredible. Imagine to max out your Roth IRA with $7,000 per year for 40 years. With 8% average annual interest rate, after 40 years, you're going to have $1,825,000 before inflation for your retirement funds, which is not bad. So you want to be making sure you're always contributing to your IRAs and for 1K and possibly max them out because of the tax benefits that you get. When it comes to cash, I'm still going to hold around six months of expenses in an emergency fund. This is something I've always done and it's been great because it gives me peace of mind and it allows me to invest the rest with less worries. In the past, I used to hold much more cash, above all last year, because I wanted to keep it for opportunities like a market crash or a correction. But I'm not doing it from now on. I know that crashes or corrections can always happen. They will most likely happen next year or the next after it, but when they do, you think you actually have an advantage by having more cash to invest. Truth is, it's not like this. I back tested different strategies that investors can actually apply to their investing to try to time the market. Like investing only when the market has been down for three months or when the PE ratio has been the highest of the last three months and many others. And looking at 20 years results as well as 50 years results, the best outcome was always by dollar cost averaging into the stock market every single month. When it comes to asset allocation, I'm going to focus on ETFs and index funds and only invest in single stocks if there is a particular crash of a sector or of the markets that make stocks incredibly cheap. Usually, there are three reasons for which I invest in single stocks, and they are. One, a market crash. 
In this case, overvalued stocks crash more than the S&P 500. Two, a price drop due to temporary fixable issues, just like it happened in Meta in 2022. And three, because I'm more patient than Wall Street. Wall Street can invest better and quicker than us, but invests with other people's money. So they have to rely on the patience of people that have no patience. Me, on the other side, I'm patient, so I can invest in single companies that in the long term are going to give me a much higher return than in ETF. Generally speaking though, I'm going to focus on ETFs except if some stocks become really, really undervalued. Another thing is I'm still not going to buy bonds. I'm too young for it, even though I'm not in my 20s anymore, but I share Buffett's view that in the long term, the equity market always returns better than the bond market. So I'm not in a hurry to balance my stocks with bonds of any nature. Another thing that you must be ready for is a strong correction of the technology market. In my opinion, there is no way that the tech market is going to return like in 2024 or 2023, and it might even have a strong correction. The price to earning ratio of the tech sector is almost as high as it was in 2000. There was a year of the dot-com bubble and where investors lost so much money that the market took almost 15 years to recover from it. So I'm glad that I built a strong core position in the S&P 500 because if such an event will occur, I need to be able to hold on to my positions and not sell them. Nevertheless, I do have an overweight in technology because except for my S&P 500, I have growth ETFs and single tech companies. So I'm getting ready for some really difficult months next year. Another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to increase my month investments. I'm going to do a new budget for my finances, try to cut out something more that I don't need and manage to invest possibly around $500 more every month compared to what I invested so far. And for those of you who don't do it, I suggest you try to automate your investments because investing is actually something that should be done with as little control as possible. Ideally, you should actually set up a system that invests every month and just forget about it for 10, 20 years. Lastly, I'm not going to invest in real estate, but I might buy a bigger place for me and my wife if we start having children, and I'm gonna rent my current flat to generate some additional income. Other than that, I still have around $20,000 in cryptocurrencies, and it's the same portfolio that I have since years. I haven't bought anything more. I have Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Binance Coin, WorldCoin, and I'm not going to buy anything more, First, because it's growing a lot now, and so it's a really expensive price. And second, because for me, it's still a bet. I don't know exactly what's gonna to happen to cryptocurrencies in the future. So I'm just gonna keep this at around 5% of my portfolio. Now it's um, maybe a bit less but I'm not gonna add anything to it. But anyway, let me know your thoughts, not only about crypto, but in general about your strategy for 2025. And if you haven't done it, consider subscribing to the channel and ring the bell for a small notification of future videos. Thanks for watching, guys. I wish you a great day or evening, and as always, I'll see you in the next video. Ciao.